I think I broke Unlike Uncle play. Banzai, we don't have to pay for this by the inch. <laughs> yes. <laughs> they have a live recording of you. Well, Cersei, I thought I'd get us off on a serious note. Cersei is far and away the longest chapter in the book. In my opinion, it's the toughest. Now, you made it through Oxen, and you're still going strong. So, now we're going to make it through Cersei, and then it's smooth sailing. We're going to have some resolution after this one. Now, this chapter is so intense, I decided to break it into at least two parts, maybe three. Let's see how it goes. I don't want these videos to be too long because Cersei is intense enough. So let's just get to it and see how we do. Now, this video is going to give you the background uh, that comes from the Odyssey, as we always do. And I want to take us up to the point that Bloom enters the brothel of Bella Cohen. So uh, that's this video and then in the subsequent video we'll deal with what happens from that point forward and if I have to break that into two we'll make that decision later but for right now this video gets us into Bella Cohen's brothel. Alright so let's start like my witch hat by the way Let's start with a little background on the on the episode. Now, it's written in the style of a play, so there's stage direction. You know, this guy walks over here, stands at this place, speaks these lines. That's what I mean by in the structure of a play. So this <clears throat> this episode is written as though it were a play. Now, who are the players? We have Bloom and Steven are our central characters to be sure. But then we have everybody else in the book. Just about everybody that's made any kind of appearance in this book is going to make an appearance in this chapter. They come and go. 99% of the stuff that happens in this chapter don't really happen. All right, so most of it is hallucinate, uh, hallucination as a result of the green fairy, absinthe. Okay, so Absinthe, as we recall from the previous episode, uh, the, the guys are drinking that at the end of the episode, and that causes hallucinations. Remember, this alcohol was so freaky potent and caused such weird effects that it was banned in the U.S. Uh, up until fairly recently. So it's strong stuff. This entire episode which Joyce has set us up for in the previous by getting them to drink absinthe is absinthe is really about hallucination. So this is a, a dark, weird, scary, creepy hallucination chapter. In the Odyssey, after they go to the island of the Lestragonians, remember those were the, the cannibals, a lot of the crew got killed there. They were eaten. They venture to the island of Circe. Now, they don't know what's ahead here. Like always, the, the scouting party goes out to see what's going on, and, and they report back to Odysseus and he's, to tell him, 
right? So the, this band of uh, his men go off and they find the, the palace of Circe. They all go in but one, okay? One of them stays outside to sort of keep an eye out for what's going on. The men go in. Circe is a witch, turns them into pigs, all right? So the men are turned into pigs and they're herded into Circe's pig pen where she can be entertained by these uh, pigs that still have their human brains, but they are men turned to pigs. There's some interesting thoughts around this, that we have men and their sexuality becoming pigs, they're drunk, they become pigs, um, their slovenliness, the, 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 all the ickiness of mankind makes them piggish. Uh, there's a lot you can derive just from that, that I think even Homer was trying to tell us, but Joyce plays on this even more thoroughly. So the men are turned into pigs. They're herded into Circe's pig pen. The guy that didn't go in runs back to the ship, and he tells Odysseus that, uh, you know, what happened. The guys got turned into pigs, and Odysseus, as usual, grabs his sword, and I will go save them. Now he heads off to the palace of Circe, and on his way, he's met by Hermes. Hermes comes down, and he gives him this magic root. Uh, it's called a moly. He gives him this this black root that has magic powers over Circe. Now in the in the in the presence of this magic root, she can't have any power over Odysseus. So he's got his black root and he goes to the palace of Circe. He gets inside the palace, Circe sees him, she wants to turn him into a pig, but of course she's helpless because he's carrying the root. He pulls the sword, he threatens to kill her, and she thinks, I like this guy. I like this guy. You know, he seems like my kind of guy. Now, the other guys, you know, they're just pretty much pigs. But this guy's different. I like this guy. So Odysseus decides not to kill her. They start chatting a little bit. He tells her to turn the guys back from pigs into men. She does so. They go off to feast, and Odysseus goes off to uh, make whoopee with Circe. And uh, that is such an enjoyable experience. They end up staying a year. Okay, so Odysseus is not the perfect guy. You know, we've had this bit where he's just trying to get home to dear old Penelope, but he's been at it for 10 years, and he had some voluntary stayovers on the way. All right, so here's another one. He decides to stay with Circe. He spends a year with her. And uh, that's basically what happens in the, in the Odyssey. Eventually they leave. Circe packs him up with some supplies and says, go on your way, and they and they leave from there. As I said at the very beginning when we started our own Odyssey, Joyce does not follow the Odyssey. He's not meant to make a remake. This is shadowing it. So even the chapters are not necessarily in order. So when we have the Circe chapter, it's not necessarily nearing the end. Okay, so the, the chapters sort of occur in, you know, Joyce's order. Joyce... Uh, gives us Bloom running down the street. He gets a stitch in his side. He's lost his breath. He's trying to catch up with Stephen and Lynch as they head into Nighttown. And he's lost them. He can't he can't find them. It's it's a dark, dank, creepy, confusing place. And Bloom has lost track of them. Now this episode is, is called the Transform Transformation Episode. It's about that early metempsychosis that Molly brought up. You know, oh, rocks. You know, what is this word? Tell us what he is when he's at home. And, and Bloom explains that metempsychosis is the transmigration of the souls, a sort of re a, a reincarnation, if you will. This entire episode is about that transformation about the change as with the Odyssey men turn to pigs Joyce gives us something a little more complex here that we're not only turning to pigs but we're going to find mankind and you know hopefully evolve back we'll see what happens before we get to the brothel of Bella Cohen which is our destination in this episode 
we've got some things to do. All right, now Bloom is on the street and we get this really amazing description. I hope you, and I say this every video, go back and read it, read it slow. Man, Stephen King has got nothing on Joyce. This place is the creepiest place I think I've ever encountered in literature, movies, anywhere. It starts with that description of the tram tracks, which during the day is it's a busy thing, it's noisy, it's where the trams go, right? And they, they, they hop over tram tracks and we see the cattle going off on the uh, crossing the tram tracks and having to stop things and it, you know they the the tram is there throughout the episode as a means of transportation in this place the tracks turn into a skeleton which is to me is a it's a great beginning of a description we get that that darkness the eeriness just right off the bat and then we get the red eyes of the sand scattering machine you know and this big thing is coming now they scatters sand to like catch waste you know imagine there's horses and all this dung and all this stuff in the street it's garbagey so they scatter sand so that the trams can get traction you know from the horse droppings and stuff that's in the street probably garbage and it's easier to pick up the sand absorbs all the spillage and stuff and then they can clean it up so this big like street sweeper machine is coming with the glowing red eyes and it nearly runs over Bloom and then the the bike riders come by and they almost hit him and you know it's just a, a scary creepy dark ugly scene okay so what else do we get night town is this dark creepy ugly place all right from the skeletons of the tracks the red eyes of the sand spreader we get these misformed characters first first we get a description of children as these dwarfs that are munching these ice cream things and because the light is bad in the gaslight it 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 doesn't look like joyful children eating ice cream they're eating the, the dark coral colored stuff you know in in the weird gaslight and then we get the the crone, which is an old woman. We get the old woman is bagging up the bottles, and she finds a, a bottle and she sticks it in the maw of the sack. And then her her kid, which is kind of creepy description, comes and crawls up her leg and grabs onto her dress, and she goes off into the dark with that sack of broken glass. We have the the navvy. Now a navvy is a, a manual laborer, typically a digger. That term came from the, the guys who worked on digging the canals. So it's just a manual labor. Um, later, uh, later in culture, as machinery was developed, they began calling earth moving machines navvies. You know, bring the navvy to dig the, the trench to lay the pipe and stuff. So a navvy is, is not some old guy that was in the Navy, as I originally thought, years ago when I first read this. A navvy is a manual laborer, a, a digger. So we have an allusion to maybe the, the grave digging theme that we had back in Hades. And then and the navvy goes to the light posts and you know blows out this thing of snot and the kids are running around the light post and they crash into bloom and we have the, the bandy leg child, you know, which is yeah, bow-legged and that kid's going and then we have the St. Vitus dance which is a it, it's a it's a condition of, of being spastic it's a a nervous a, a nerve disorder and we have that person going and they can't speak and the kids stop them and and make them salute and he can't speak and he's jerking down the road we have all this dark creepy ugly stuff and then we get the the uh, from the manhole covers and and every opening in the ground we get the snakes of fog are coming up and it's stench we get the smell and the and the fog and you can just picture this fog coming up like from a manhole cover and snaking along the ground and 
the stink and the just the ick of it. Joyce does this amazing job of just giving us icky after icky to describe this place as, you know, we're really going into an ugly, ugly place. And we hear dishes breaking and screams and people arguing. And then we have the, the one uh, creepy person come out and s start trying to sell him a maidenhead, maidenhead inside, you know, which is a, a virgin. And it's it's just couldn't be uglier. And we have the, the dogs running around, all this stuff. It's 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 a nasty, nasty, nasty place. Now, where are we going? Where is this nasty place? Well, of course, it's night town in Dublin. But where is it really? Where we're going is in to the dark places of the human mind. We're going where guilt lives. All right, that's where Joyce is taking us into our mind, where all our ugly stuff, all the things we don't speak to others about, all the stuff we feel bad about, all the ugliness inside us, that's where we're going inside of ourselves where the dark part of ourselves is. This is a, he's not describing a place. We're going into our own. Now, we can justify that because most of the stuff that happens in this episode, 95% of it, maybe more, doesn't even occur. It's hallucination from this stuff, absinthe. All right, so he's taking us into this very dark, ugly place. And where is that place? Right here. Okay. We'll see Bloom confront all of his inner guilts, all of his foibles, sins, if you will. All right. Now, it starts with Bloom buys a pig foot and a sheep foot that's cooked you know, old Bloom is always a man for the stomach. Here it is, midnight, and, you know, he <laughs> doesn't want to be caught without food. The first we see of him, he's jamming bread and chocolate into his pocket, which he probably picked up somewhere along the line. No wonder he lost Stephen and Lynch. He stops, he can't walk past food, right? So he's stuffing the bread and chocolate in his pocket, and then he sees a butcher shop, and he ducks in there, and he buys a sheep's foot and a pig foot, and it's... Uh, wrapped up in paper and he sticks that in his pocket and he immediately kind of feels guilty about that. That was kind of stupid. He knows he overpaid for it and he thinks about that waste and then lo and behold, who does he run into but the first uh, early hallucination here is his father, his dead father. And his father says, is that is that my son Leopold? And he, he touches him with talon-like claws, you know, he's he's given it this, and he has to touch his face. Now, in, in the Old Testament, you can research this if you want, but that's, you know, as the the old, I, I think it's Abraham loses his sight, and the, then he tries to recognize his sons by he has to touch the face to know who it is, so that's, that's the reference there, but, and then it refers to the yellow streaks down his face from the from the poison that he took when he committed suicide. So he's he's touching his face, and this is an apparition, of course, he's he's dead, and he starts to lay the guilt on Leopold. He tells him, what are you doing out with these goy, you know, you shouldn't be out with them, drinking, wasting yourself, wasting your money, you know, how much have you spent already? You know, and he, he gives him a lecture about that and being out, and then, oh, oh no, Papa, there's a, there's a, you know, I'm, I'm not drinking with them. It's, it's okay. And, um, and then it, his father reminds him of the time when you remember when you came in late with all your good clothes with mud all over you. You know, you were all messed up. And he says, oh, but the guys they challenged me to a sprint, a race, and I fell in the mud, Papa. And it's, you know, and it's all oh, the break your mother's heart to come home late, drunk, muddy. And, you know, his father heaps on the guilt. Then his mother shows up. And his mother, oh, Virgin Mary or whatever she says, she gets, she lays on some more guilt. 
So this is where it starts to heap on, right? Now, Bloom, he gets he gets through that episode and he decides he's he doesn't need the the crew bean. He's gonna get rid of these animal parts that he bought and he sees the dog and he he he's first he's gonna give him one and he says, oh, might as well give him both. He's not gonna eat it anyway. He needs he feels guilty, he's kinda of grossed out by this whole scene. He feels like he overspent. So he he gives them both to the dog. Immediately the patrol is is on him, you know, and another phantom, right? And they cite him for cruelty to animals. And he says, No, no, I was I was doing a good thing, you know, and Bloom again is on trial. His guilt is over, you know, spending this money. He spent the money. He didn't, uh, you know, he's not retained the money for his family. He's spending money like Stephen is off drinking, wasting away his money. He just spent this money. He's overpaid, shouldn't have done it. Now he's giving it to dogs. He wastes money. So that's another guilt. And the guilt manifests itself in the terms of this patrolman who begins to charge him with cruelty to animals. And Bloom explains his way out of that one. Bloom runs into, uh, I'm doing these notes and I can't, I'm not even reading them because I'm thinking about what I'm trying to say to you. So he runs into his, his old girlfriend, Mrs. Breen. And they start out a, a tad flirtatious, but then she starts to threaten him. You know, they, they talk a little about the good old times and uh, when they were dating and at the party they went to, I think, playing charades or something. And then she starts threatening him that that she's going to tell Molly right about now that they're meeting and that he's flirting with her. And uh, no, 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 uh, that's, no, no. And then he thinks, what am I going to tell Molly? Um, I'll tell her I was at Leah. I was at Leah. Remember that Leah, the play is going on, and he thought about that earlier. He he saw the poster for it, and he thought, well, I can go there later because he can't go home because you know he doesn't know when Boylan's going to leave. So he thought about going to the play. So when she lays this on him, he says, oh, he starts thinking of an excuse. The guilt is going all the time, right? And so he's going to tell her, oh, I, I went to Leah. I was at I was. And then Molly appears, and she appears with a camel, and she's dressed up in her Moroccan uh, garb, um, Gibraltar, I suppose that's where she grew up, so it's, it's a Moroccan Gibraltar type uh, getup, and, and she begins to humiliate him, and he feels guilty over his relationship with Molly, and that's eating at him, and we can see that happening here and he's he forgot to go back and pick up the lotion and he remembers oh, oh he promised her he would do that I'll get it tomorrow first thing I you know and he remembers the the chemist giving him the price and the the, the bottle and the whole bit and you know he's he's feeling guilt with every character he encounters um Molly included Gertie shows up. We hear, we we see her appear, Gertie McDowell from Nausicaa, and she's bleeding. And she says, "Look what you've done to me! Look what you did, you dirty man!" Sort of in a yucky way, you know, not in a not in a hurt way, not in a sad way, but in a kind of nasty way. He's guilty about that. All these guilts are flying at Bloom. So as you go through this first part of the chapter, look for that. Look for the creepy ugliness that Joyce gives us, which is our theater of the mind when we go to our guilts and our dark places. And then look for all the things that are references, all these encounters of Bloom, they're all rooted in guilt, okay? We hear Sissy Caffrey singing that rather body song, which again contributes to the painting of this of this picture. So many things turn into a trial for Bloom. He's accused. He's accused. He's accused. You see this happen over and over and over and over. Now, he's got the potato, right? So he seems to come through these things. He deals with it. They these phantasms kind of dissipate and he makes it to the next step
because he's still got the potato, the lucky potato, right? So, Bloom, as he progresses, he sees a glow in the sky, and, and he wonders what, and he thinks about some things that it might be. No, the fireworks are over. What is it? And then, ah, uh, the brigade. There's a fire. Somebody's house is burning. And then he looks, no, I'm, I'm over there. That's not me. Hmm, maybe it's, maybe it's his house. Maybe he's thinking Boylan's house is burning, you know. And then he dismisses that and, and goes on. We see Dignam show up as a dog in the form of a dog and he digs down into the ground and we hear Dignam as he goes down in the tunnel and buries him buries himself as a as a dog we see Mary Driscoll Mary Driscoll was a house servant that the Blooms employed for a while um, a sort of a girl live-in housekeeper and she was fired for supposedly stealing some oysters and it was never really proven that she stole these oysters and Bloom sort of thanks Molly wanted to get rid of her because she was jealous and she now uh, Driscoll ac accuses Bloom of uh, making a pass at her or trying to get her to have sex with him and of course he knows that isn't that isn't true is another guilt that Bloom must must deal with the whole scene here everything we see happen is a nightmare of the inner mind the plays that run in our heads over guilt these are all the guilt trappings that Bloom experiences we see Stephen walking down the street he does his little black mass he does the the introit to the service right to the to the paschal portion which is interestingly it's i'm making this video on the day before easter and the uh, introit to the paschal is the beginning of the uh, communion portion of the service and and stephen does his own little sort of black mass as buck mulligan did at the very beginning of the book and we see him mimic some gestures of bread and water and then they talk about you know Lynch kicks the dog and and Stephen says that you know who needs words we don't need words the the gesture is the universal communication and the, the kicking the dog away that's all the communication we need now he's discouraged as a writer and who needs words just kick the dog so we see Stephen is bombed out of his brain he's mocking now the church and staggering around with with Lynch the uh, soldiers see him and they say they see him in black and they say let the parson pass that's because he's dressed Stephen is dressed in black and they go by and they'll have their encounter a bit later so let me wrap this up I hope that wasn't too rambling I wanted you to know what's going on this gets you about a third of the way through the chapter it's a big series of hallucinations we in terms of advancement of the action we see Stephen moving down the street somewhat insignificantly he's he's on his way to someplace he knows he's going to Bella Cohen's he's been there before he knows where he's going and he's going with Lynch so there's not much significance there most of what happens is revolving around Bloom and all of these things that happen to Bloom are guilt tied now in this chapter we're gonna see almost everybody from the book all the characters they're all gonna pop up and make an appearance and pop out all as accusers all as guilt pieces for good old Leopold Bloom he is facing his every guilt now this episode is transformation as I said at the beginning it's it's that that metempsychosis we're beginning to see the transformation of Bloom all right now there's a there's an expression in the biblical teaching about that you know if you want to be born again you have to die first Bloom is dying in all of his guilts okay we will see 
the new Blamusulum. <laughs> All right, that's referred in the chapter. That's where we're going. We will see Bloom rise again, hopefully. We are dealing with all his guilts and his foibles. Now, the book, in my opinion, is about Bloom. It's not about Bloom looking for a son. It's, it's much deeper than that. It's about this guy, Bloom, looking for maturity and his solution to these life problems that he has. Stepping back putting the camera up here. I believe this is about Joyce looking at himself as Stephen and the character in his life, Bloom. Now he was, the, the, Joyce was passed out drunk on the street, had a very similar experience and a, and a Jewish man brought him in, saved him, revived him and took him off the street. So he has had this experience, Joyce. So he's writing about something he knows, and I believe that the metempsychosis, the blooming, is Joyce himself doing this cathartic process to take himself from the adolescent, drunk, immature, to the full man. Now we have that reference from Shakespeare that came up earlier. The boy in Act 1 is the mature man of Act 5. I believe this is what Joyce is telling us here. You can debate this with me in the comments, but I believe that in this episode we see these two characters, Stephen and Bloom, finally get into the same room. This is a mixing pot here. They're finally in the same place. The question is not, is Bloom going to find a son? The question is, is Bloom going to find himself? And what will happen with Stephen? Does does the boy become a man, or do we shed that and go on to bigger things? And we'll see what happens there. This chapter, while the toughest, is certainly the most, probably the most important in terms of bringing us to the climax of everything that's happening, everything that this book is about is focused and magnified in this chapter. So you've got to take this one really easy. This is by far the hardest. That's why I wanted to break the videos down. But it is very important. Now when you come out of this chapter, you're going to be exhausted. Believe me, it's hard to understand. This first part, while creepy, is digestible. You can at least tell what's going on. It gets pretty intense as we get inside Bella Cohen's brothel. Now notice Bella Cohen is, uh, that's a Jewish name, no coincidence there either. So they're really giving it all to us in this episode, okay? Okay, so Bloom meets Zoe Higgins. Zoe is in the employ of Bella Cohen. She's outside, probably outside to grab guys going by, right? She's trolling for business. She sees Bloom. He's dressed in black. She figures, ah, oh, must be with Stephen. These guys must be together. They must have been at the same party, if you know what I mean. So she, she assumes they're together. She plays around with Bloom a bit. She reaches into his pocket and she says, oh, you're, you're already excited. And, no, no. And she says, oh, yes, you are. And, and she probes around in his pocket, and then she pulls out the potato. Now, she's got his talisman, his lucky charm, his moly protection from the witch. She now has it, right? Bloom is taken aback by this. He's, he's stunned at first, and they have some interaction, which I think you can easily figure out. But the key takeaway is that Bloom is now disarmed. She tells him where Stephen is and invites him inside. And Bloom will go inside, but he is disarmed. So, what's going to happen next? Where is this going to go? 
Well, we're going to we're going to find out. This is one of the most profound chapters in all of literature. So really seriously take it slow because it's a rough one. But if you take it slow, it's extremely rewarding. Look at all the guilts that Bloom is facing. Think about what our own psyche is all about, right? This is what Joyce is giving us. I like to, at this point, also think about how dense this book is and how much material we've covered from, from history and sliding into uh, fascism to evolution of language, treatment of art, guilt, relationship between husbands and wives, fathers and sons, the birth, life, death cycle. <laughs> Look at all the stuff that's packed into this book. It's amazing. This is a big climax. Now there's great stuff after this. I'm not saying from here out it's easy sailing and nothing to it. But this episode is very important. Take it slow, study it. If you start to feel a little creepy, put it down for a while and then go back to it. And if you start to feel real creepy, you're getting it. Slancha.